Hello and welcome. This is Josh Applebach, head cross country and track coach of Campo Verde High School Coyotes. And I'm joined today by Mr. John Marcus, uh, coach and director of High Performance West. John, thank you so much for being with us. Josh, how are you doing, man? I'm doing very well. Thank you again for spending some time talking with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Could you kind of explain for me, first of all, um, your background, how you found yourself in the place that you're at now, coaching High Performance West with uh, elite athletes? Can you kind of give me the story on how you got to the point you're at in just a few minutes? Yeah, um, got done with college, looked around, decided that I really wanted to go in coaching, so just started from the ground floor, went to my high school, um, started off as a volunteer assistant coach, first year out of college, and went from there to a small AI school where I was assistant coach my first mentor, Dave Lee. Went from AI to Division One with Rob Connor at University of Portland. Uh, under his mentorship, and then kind of got the reins to my own program, or at least in the distance category, as an assistant coach in charge of distance at Portland State University, another Division One mid-major program. And then from there, started to cultivate while I was at Portland State, the uh, enclave of just like local elite post collegiates who were in the area, wanted to train at a little higher level, had eyes on making like the national championships in track or cross country. Um, but also very fortunate to be able to study under Jerry Schumacher and Alberto Salazar for several years, them being in the Portland area. And one thing led to another, and so I'd make my own group up, and here we are today with High Performance West. Yeah, very cool. So in, in very, very incremental steps, kind of working away literally from that volunteer high school position to where you're at in, in almost every step along the way, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, brick by brick, step yeah. by step. I mean, there was no – I did not, you know, uh, walk between the raindrops. Like, I paid my dues, and, you know, sometimes I still feel like I am paying my dues, you know? Well, um, yeah, I, th- I think recently we've seen a lot of your athletes in the spotlight um, between Daniel Herrera and Eleanor uh, Fulton just doing incredible things. So uh, congratulations on all your success. Oh, appreciate it. Yeah, I'll pass it on to the athletes. They're really the ones who are making it happen on the tracks. It's been a pleasure to be a part of their journey. Very cool. Let's talk about training athletes. Mm-hmm. So the approach that you take is pretty different from the quote-unquote conventional approach to training distance athletes, from what I gather. Mm-hmm. Um, how exactly does your approach to training athletes differ from what probably most coaches are doing? Well, I'll give you my synopsis of what the conventional uh, training system is, you know, from in contemporary America, typically is going to be linear base, starting with something that's going to look like a base phase of um, high volume training or aerobic based training. And then from there, essentially like a pyramid, right, where you level up in the pyramid and you get to faster quality race specific work, sharpening work, quote unquote peaking. Um, for me, I think the best way to think about it is more of an iceberg. So there's two pyramids, but the first one is kind of hidden underneath the um, the water, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So it's an inverted pyramid. So we start fast, and then as we go from that sharp, fast, neurological, like more neurophysiological approach, we're trying to get coordination, trying to get power, trying to get speed, and trying to get athletes moving better in an effort so they can move more. So that then they can work their way up from this kind of iceberg of speed to be able to sustain what most people start at, which is going to be that base of volume and aerobic capacity. From there, that's more sustainable. And then, obviously, then they can create a wider capacity for a variety of different work, whether it be physiological um, from the thoracic cavity, the heart and lungs, or and or also complementary for neurological from the brain, releasing hormones, coordinating, expressing power, you know, at a smooth, solid clip in real time. So I think what it is, it's it's more of a blend of what is conventional sprint mechanics, or I mean, I shouldn't say mechanics, but conventional sp- approaches to training that sprinters utilize, where, you know, say from Dan Path, from Gambetta, Stu McMillan, um, I should say methodology combined with that kind of classical traditional approach that 
it really has been highlighted by Lydiard and sustained by Jerry Schumacher, mm-hmm. which is long and strong, lots of volume, don't run speed and get sharp until the very, very end before you're at that, you know, close to your target competition. Yeah, so I um, I love the analogy that you're using there of the uh, the sprint pyramid supporting the endurance pyramid essentially. You know, it seems that you're working mechanics to endurance, and then endurance to sprint. And I just I guess I never visualized it in that brilliant way. Um, yeah. And so I guess I would ask then. Obviously, there's some anecdotal evidence, some experience um, that you've seen with athletes using that approach and and reaching high levels, but. Is there also some, I guess, evidence to to back that up? Have there been studies that you've read that, that have led you to that conclusion, or is that more of a, a hunch that kind of built you into that spot? Um, you know, because that is, I think, very, very counter to what has always been done. Yeah, I think, you know, it's um, we have to look at the difference between a simplistic model and a simplified model. And you know, human being and training is a very complex organism and it's a complex ecosystem and adaptation is not always direct and transfer is not always, you know, do X, get one, two, three as a response. And so, but we do have to create simplified models of these complex inner workings. And what it is, is, you know, being privileged to be around, you know, world-class athletes with, you know, Alvaro Salazar and Jerry Schumacher's group, and also even very high level division one athletes at the time with Rob Connor and University of Portland, you know, Jerry and, Rob both came from that more traditional, long and strong, lots of volume, really worked the aerobic metabolism. That's the point of emphasis. What you saw or what I saw was what I witnessed was a lot of overuse injuries purely from a standpoint of just, you know, mechanics that structurally had some asymmetries and couldn't handle the load of volume that they were being subject to. Contrast that with, say, Salazar's approach, we took a vertical integration, so multi different multifactorial point of view where strength training mechanics all these elements were things that they considered because frankly you know Alberto's mindset was if they get hurt it doesn't matter and you know so it's like we need to not get the athlete hurt first and foremost right Mm -hmm. so it's that Hippocratic of do no harm and then by saying well let's not get him hurt but we need him to run very fast we need to have him run a lot because we need to build capacity and we also need to be build um, their tolerance to a wider um, capacity as well. You know, how are we going to solve that problem? So really it's just a solution. And the solution is saying, well, what, what is, do distance runners do that is conventional? What do sprinters do? I don't see a lot of sprinters getting stress-related injuries from stress fractures or things of that nature Mm -hmm. because they're running at very high velocities and incurring a lot high impact forces when they do sprint. But yet what they do in the fall is they spend a lot on shaping and honing mechanics, posture, alignment, control, strength, you know, coordination, power. And then they're able to sustain this really high neural load throughout the course of an indoor and outdoor season for six months. And if programmed correctly or programmed intelligently, not have a whole lot of breakdown or illness or injury. Yet we, from a distance running background, you know, our conventions are, we just speak in terms of mileage and how fast or how long it took you to run a certain interval um, on the track or a certain interval on the trail. So, I, you know, I think it was just being around those um, mentors of mine and seeing the problems they were facing and the limiting factors they had that you had very highly talented or capable athletes on the shelf unable to compete and unable to train and unable to get better simply because of stress related injuries. And not knowing or having readily available solutions to that and just purely accepting it as, you know, a part of the process and part of a course. Like I, you know, I think stress related injuries and distance running should be unacceptable, but yet we do accept stress reactions and stress fractures as, you know, just, uh, you know, part of the risk involved with training for this. And, you know, I, 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 you look around other sports, you know, baseball player or basketball player doesn't, get a stress-related injury from swinging or from, you know, jumping up and down, like how many stress factors do basketball players get? There's a lot of high impact forces, and they're running many miles throughout the course of the season, sure. but yet we, we, hear, we don't hear that often. So I think it, that, to me, then coupled with um, talking with Dan Papp, who's seen a lot, Vern Gambetta, you know, 
mentors of mine who've been to a lot of Olympics and coached a lot of high functioning athletes and a lot of scholastic and developing athletes and then pointing me to different literature and saying, well, yeah, there's a lot to be said for this neurological component Mm -hmm. that we tend to because exercise phys is very thoracic based and just looks at what's going on in that cavity without actually saying, well, the central governor lies in the brain and that's the thing that controls all these different, you know, systems, whether they're, um, you know, uh, conscious or subconscious, it just got me thinking and thinking and thinking. And then thank, thank goodness I had, you know, some open-minded athletes who were willing to try something new and different because they were felt like they had reached a ceiling or limitations with the conventional model. And, you know, that's, that's why you've, you've seen kind of these developmental athletes who are not really big stars in college by any means, with like say Herrera and Fulton, who you referenced earlier, becoming people who are now national caliber, uh, just because of open mind and um, you know the willingness to try a new and a different approach. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway in there might just be the injury prevention. Um, you know, how does a coach keep their injury rate as low as possible? I mean, maybe that ought to be the ultimate goal of what high school coaches uh, and really any coaches uh, are doing. Is you know, if, if these athletes are going to participate, which is the reason why they're here, how do we keep their injury rate? really low. I've had conversation with a couple of coaches who have said, yeah, our injury rate is somewhere under 10%. And that's maybe something worth high fiving and celebrating over, you know, um, how few kids we've injured, maybe the conversation should be, regardless of however fast they can run at the end of all of this, did we do a good job of keeping them healthy, keeping them safe, keeping them involved in the sport that they've chosen to participate in? As a coach, you have to ask yourself very crisply, what are you trying to do? And if you're trying to set the athlete up for long-term success and long-term enjoyment of the sport, you don't want to do anything that's going to get them and keep them in the injury cycle. And then, two, if you're going to try to set them up to, uh, you know, whether that athlete's ceiling is their high school career or there's someone who wants to go on and compete in college – Two, you're trying to set them up, okay, for their highest pinnacle. And then what does that foundation look like? How much time do you have? What's that athletes and that kid's athlete level of engagement? Are they bought into this? You know, those are all very important psychological factors that must be considered before we even start to discuss, you know, kind of the physiological um, methodology that you're going to employ. And from there, you know, once you kind of answer those psychological questions from a physiological standpoint, you're more – to me, you know, people always ask me, well, what drills should you do? I go, med ball. Just do med ball drills because, you know, A skip and B skip are great, but unless that has a tr- interpretation and translates to how the athlete moves, mm-hmm. you're just kind of wasting your time. But a med ball is what you're doing with med ball drills, right? If you're throwing an overhead med ball down to the ground very crisply or throwing it, you know, kind of a rotational wall um, toss or a squat overhead toss. You're getting an instantly the athlete to express speed and strength, which is power, mm-hmm. which is the currency of running fast and the currency of coordination um, in a very direct way. And, you know, whether even though your the power might be uh, penultimately or finalized, expressed in the arms moving this med ball up or against a wall, we know that those neural synapses actually create new pathways and create new, you know, um, firing mechanisms transfer all over the body, right? Because you just can move more like, quote, unquote, an athlete. And we see that. You see that all the time, right? Uh, soccer athletes or basketball athletes who come out and run track like, whoa, that person just moves really well. Mm-hmm. Well, they, they already have kind of predated for however many years these inbuilt coordination patterns that maybe the runner who told they weren't, quote, unquote, athletic or not coordinated, you know, got tossed to just running and all they had to do was put one foot down in front of the other. And that is the exposure of coordination that they have. So, you know, to me, I think I look at running just as much as I look at sprinting. It's a highly complex coordinative activity. I mean, you're trying to move at different speed gradients and degrees throughout a race, whether it be a race pace, a kick, what have you. Well, the athlete has to have some body control and awareness and coordinate ability to be able to do that well. And especially under a high cognitive fog, of increasing, you know, um, acidosis profile or positive HIMs getting onto the muscle belly there mm-hmm. and be able to keep that central governor 
crisp and on task versus getting off task and deviating to, oh, I feel bad. Oh, I don't feel awesome. You know, giving into that, that fog of discomfort that is, you know, so typical at the end of a distance race. Sure. Yeah. Well, hey, I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with me. Um, I want to be really respectful of sure. your time. Um, if, if you have time for one more question, we can go there. If not, I understand. Yeah, no, go ahead. Shoot. Okay. You know, working with athletes that are transitioning from one level to the next, um, what are some common challenges that athletes face? Um, and how do we as coaches um, best help athletes to successfully make that jump from one level to the next, whether it be high school to college, uh, and then maybe perhaps for the, the uh, very elite from college to that next level if they choose to go there? I guess I'm thinking more along the lines of their physiology. Um, have, uh-huh. you, have you noticed some kind of characteristic challenges that are that are common to athletes in any of those jumps there yeah i think you know number one is just uh like closing speed right this concept of speed reserve so how fast you know one can move at um maximum velocity or critical velocity over 30 meters Uh, as you go up in competitiveness obviously people who stay competitive are still playing the game have really good speed reserve so you know not exposing athletes at the younger levels, whether it's high school or even college, to a certain degree of speeders or training them just as simply just running, you know, a handful of max 30 velocity fly sprints where, you know, five, five, four seconds, you're, they're running full out, uh, you know, a handful of times, you know, you know, once every week or two weeks, that's going to have, that's going to create a really low floor for their foot speed. And so I, you know, I think in terms of we're trying to elevate people's floor and if you elevate the floor it looks like the ceiling's getting higher but you know the room's still the same same situation here you know i just see that people constantly come to a model of i need to get better aerobic capacity i need to you know get stronger at my you know tempo runs or what have you it doesn't matter if you get to the end of the race and you you physically can't move your body you know for like a male in the 1500 at 51 seconds 50 seconds flat if you can't just do that even fresh you have no chance to, you know, compete for a gold medal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, same deal on the women. I mean, if you, just, if you can't close in 28, 27, you know, 29 even in the 1500, even if it's you're going 64s or you're going 74s, you have mm-hmm. no shot. So that, you know, we tend to write that off from a, as distance coaches a very, um, from a very uh, shallow and superficial um, simplistic model of just saying, oh, you either have foot speed or you don't. And it's like, no, that's a skill. That's something that can be taught. Just how people can swing a golf club or shoot a basketball. Um, or even how and, sprinters become faster sprinters. Yes, exactly. I mean, it, it, when you understand it's really the brain is having a conversation with the rest of the body and you can train the brain because you, know, you can learn new languages. It's harder as you get older, but you can still do it. Mm-hmm. Um, then I think that opens up the door and you have to develop that mindset and that open-mindedness to a, an athlete to say, look, you know, speed does matter. Yet a lot of people think that they are um, non-congruent um, factors, speed and endurance, and, but there's nothing that says you can't do both, and you can't do both really well. So to me, I see that as like the pressing limiting factor is just people fall out of the sport when they try to compete at the next level because they keep operating with a mindset, oh, what got me here is going to get me there, which is not the case at all. And so a lot of times you have to break down and actually get them – you know, organically faster at critical speed or max velocity before you can even start to work on everything else. Otherwise, you know, the reality is they're going to be a sitting duck and just be non-competitive and being banging their head against the wall because they only have one or two tools to build this house and solve this problem when there's a bunch of other instruments out there. It just takes a little bit of education Hmm. and application Mm -hmm. in order to, you know, help, uh, you know, create a more sturdy um, structure. Yeah. Coach, um, I just want to, again, say thank you so much for your time. And uh, and then also, thank you so much for the role that you've played in the running community. But it really does mean a lot to those of us that are out there, um, you know, listening, trying really hard to glean some good information and good application to um, better athletes at, at all levels uh, from, you know, junior high, high school, cross country kids, all the way up to, um, you know, those aspiring to go much, much higher. So um, I just want to say thank you for sharing so openly, sharing so much great wisdom and experience. Um, And so thank you very much for that.
Oh, yeah, no, totally. My pleasure. I mean, I wouldn't be here if I'm interested in share liberally with me. So <laughs> it's the least I can do. Like, I kind of pay it forward. And Steve and I are happy to, you know, be doing what we're doing and also privileged and blessed. So, yeah, it's, it's a mm-hmm. joy. Awesome. Yeah, Josh, appreciate it, man. All, All right, right thank stay you. in touch.